We're living in extraordinary times, aren't we? Uh, yesterday, the captain, what was it, the Captain Cook Hotel decided to come out and, and say it was going to change its name because it was hurting people. You had a lady who uh, was upset in Wellington because she lived on Picton Ave and uh, she felt that she didn't want to live on a street anymore, that uh, that be a, uh, what was it, George Picton's uh, name. And then again this morning, the media have gone to several people in Cromwell with the title Cromwellians divided over the town's murderous namesake and divided while well, they've spoken to four people who have given varying, various opinions. So are we going down a road that actually doesn't really exist and are we playing into the game of dividing people for the sake of it because it suits a news agenda, perhaps in a country that may be irrelevant in the international conversation or is this a necessary discussion? Uh, well, let's go to Lindsay Perigo now, who's a former broadcaster and political commentator who writes a lot about this type of thing. Lindsay, good morning and thanks for your time. Good morning to you, Chris, and I'm sorry to hear about the demise of Christchurch. I assume the name of the city has to go on two counts, Christ and church. Well, you know what? It's interesting you say that because a Labour activist on Twitter has already said that the name should go. This is how the, this is how the rules of engagements have gone now, Lindsay. Has the world gone nuts, or are we simply playing into... Um, people who want to be seen to be offended in the media? Or do you think there's a bit of both here? Or, I mean, are there genuine concerns? Winston Peters called it a wave of idiocy. And he's part of the problem, actually. So coming from him, that is quite a statement. But I would go further and say it's not a wave, it's a tidal wave. It's a tsunami of hysteria and outright evil. I don't think there's anything innocent about it at all. I'm reminded of what journalist Bernard Levin, the late Bernard Levin, a great British journalist, said decades ago, and it's even more apposite now. He said, the atrophy of moral judgment is the characteristic disease of our times, the inability to see evil and the willingness to condone it. And it's vital now that we identify this insidious wokery as evil and call it that and resist it accordingly. And when we have woke politicians running the country, given that we still have the vote, we must vote them out. Do you think that in some respects, Lindsay, the media is partly to blame? Because it seems to me um, there was a, a story on Radio New Zealand that actively you know, was publishing lists of what it deemed to be offensive monuments. And I thought that actually was encouraging vandalism. And I think, you know, back in my days at the TVNZ newsroom, I can just imagine some sitting there with delight and glee hoping for a statue to be vandalised because yes. that creates news. Well, it's an upside-down world now. It's an Orwellian world. It is the world of 1984. And Winston Peters told these snowflakes to read a book. They wouldn't have read a book called 1984 but that's the world they have brought about and in that world good is evil so violence is peaceful <laughs> which I, I saw a cnn reporter standing in front of a burning building in one of those cities that is ablaze in america saying that the protests have been mostly peaceful and there was this raging fire behind him that is george orwell and that is where we are. Yes, the media have uh, a lot to do it. I think we're, we're looking at an unholy, diabolical alliance. The media, definitely. Academia, the universities. Entertainment. Uh, the churches, even the churches now have gone woke. The politicians who pander to it all, of course, who are rampant in the current government, uh, and it's not just political, it's in the private sector as well. Human resource departments in private industry, they comprise usually the gender studies graduates. Um, and even the police are going woke. 
in this Orwellian world. And you may be aware, they go door to door now asking people about their political opinions. So it's not just we're on the road to fascism. We are there. Fortunately, we do still have the vote, and we must use it to, to resist this tidal wave of wokery and get back to normalcy. It was wonderful over the weekend, Chris, to have the rugby back and to, to see you could have big crowds gathering for purposes other than rioting, looting and burning and having a good time. Yeah, it was nice to see that. It's nice to see some sense of normality return to New Zealand. Lindsay, I wonder whether, I mean, there are some genuine um, Māori who have been aggrieved by some of the Captain Cook statues in the past, and I get that, and I understand that. And, of course, there are awful examples of racism in New Zealand, but I just wonder whether the media is actually uh, being counterproductive because it seems to me, Lindsay, they're blurring the lines between genuine racism in New Zealand and sort of that mob mentality of just being offended for the sake of it. And when you blur the two together, I think it's quite counterproductive and, and dangerous because it makes a mockery of people who, who may genuinely feel aggrieved by various statues around New Zealand because this isn't new, um, the whole Captain Cook thing. But well, it seems the media seems to go to... You don't look at it. Well, that's true. Just pass it by. <laughs> I mean, mm. heavens above. Captain Cook was a hero. And he had no particular problem with Māori when he was here, nor they with him. It wasn't Māori who killed him, at least not here. Uh, and this demonising of explorers is, is typical of what goes on. Anyone worthy of hero worship uh, has to become a villain. And James Cook is, is now in that category. But this kind of sentiment is being exploited to create the racism that is real now in this country. And that is anti-white racism. I don't know a single white racist. I'm sure there are white racists. I don't happen to know any. And I don't know any white supremacist. I think the vast majority of people of all colours genuinely believe as Martin Luther King said, judge people by the content of their character, not the colour of their, their skin. Skin colour is irrelevant. And where there is historic uh, discrimination, by all means redress it in a rational, sensible, common sense way, if possible. But don't get out of bed every day to relitigate grievances from centuries ago. But why do people do that, Lindsay? I would say it's because... In order to be outraged, and I've said this before, is to have an identity of some sort. Some people want an identity. And if that means waking up and going on Twitter saying, today I'm offended by the name of Cromwell, then so be it. <laughs> but it's groupthink, you see. It's just seeking the approval of, of fellow Twitter users. And really, people should get out more or read a book, as Winston Peters would say. Um, it's a mob mentality, and it is mob behavior. And when they do take to the streets, we see what happens. It's just a logical extension of what they do on Twitter. But people need to exercise their own individual judgment more. And I think we need to repair to the notion that each of us is a sovereign individual with certain inalienable rights, and those rights are not only under threat, they've already been taken away to a significant extent here in New Zealand, and we must reclaim them while we can. Lindsay, I note that the, there have been several white Hollywood actors um, who I think they've actually been condemned because of their so-called privilege by a pet, which is ironic in itself, but they appear to have brought into the false narrative that somehow they have to announce their collective white guilt to the world. Um, but, I, but I would argue that's not only disempowering, but it's narcissistic because it only makes them feel good about themselves by saying, uh, you know, they're repenting this hideous history. Well, that's the, the so-called uh, virtue signalling. <laughs> they have to signal your virtue by... Uh, proclaiming your, your guilt as if you participated in the, in the offending events in some way, when, of course, you had, you had nothing to do with them. Um, you, you have to wonder just why is all this happening? Is there some hand behind it? And I'm an atheist, 
but the enormity of, uh, the enormity of the evil is so great that I, I, I sometimes ask myself, <laughs> is there in fact an independent agent of evil that is behind all this, uh, of which people are voluntarily partaking, but he nonetheless is the architect, that would be the devil. Now, that's a, for me, that's a crazy thought, because I don't believe in supernatural agencies. But this is so bad, I have to wonder. There is a real-life uh, devil who does have a lot to do with it. His name is George Soros, and he funds a lot of these groups, like Antifa. Antifa should be called Profa because it is pro-fascist. It is fascist. It is Mussolini's black shirts. It is Hitler's brown shirts and book burners. It is Mao Zedong's red guards. Profa. Remember that next time you're tempted to say Antifa, call it Profa. They're fascists. But they're funded by George Soros' Open Societies uh, Foundation or its proxies. He has a lot to do with it, and his purpose is globalism. He wants to see the end of sovereign nation states by means of open immigration and no borders, a borderless world. That's what he's after. Well, it's already course, started now with some of the, the cities not having, uh, you know, what do they call them now? Uh, Chairs cities where there's no um, police authority. But I note that those who have been pushing for no police are also the same uh, politicians who have their own private police armed guard standing at their door so the hypocrisy is not lost on many people Lindsay we're out of time, it is really nice to speak with you this morning, uh, Lindsay Perigo, former broadcaster and political commentator, very hot on these issues